Is it recording, do you think? Let's see. Yes, it is recording, should be recording. Um, and let's see, when is the final exam? Um, I, at the beginning of the semester, I thought that uh, our final exam was May, Wednesday, May 13th at 9.45. Um, I will double check that, of course, um, um, to make sure, but um, that's what I think it is. Oops. So today um, we're finishing up uh, Echo. And uh, last time, Last time uh, we had, uh, well, here's what I'm hoping. I'm hoping that people have gotten lab, what is it, lab, I think it's lab three. I'm hoping that people have gotten through uh, lab three. Okay, so lab three, um, you're going to have three windows running. The first window, You'll have that running. So a math handler, uh, and this math handler by default listens at port 5555. Then in window number two, you type this in. This is the proxy server using proxy handler. He's going to be listening at port 6666. And his peer is going to be the, the handler, math handler, which is at port 5555. Okay. And then finally, here is the client, simple client. And he is going to be talking to port 6666. So, um, so, um, Right, so uh, so then you're going to be typing in like add two three four. Uh, it goes to the proxy handler, which forwards it to the math handler. The math handler computes nine, returns it to the proxy handler, which returns it to the client. And I've given you some code here for that. Here is my proxy server. We need it, unfortunately. We can't use uh, the server class that we developed for lab one. Can't use that, reuse that server class because that server class doesn't know about peers. So proxy server, extends server, so he's going to inherit from server, but he has these two additional features. In a second, I've got to mute somebody here. He's got peers, he's got a peer, right? And a peer server. And so what is the port that the peer server's on? What host is the peer uh, server running on? A, uh, in, in lab three, that, um, that peer is the, uh, lab three, that peer is gonna be the math server, right? And then here we have a constructor which initializes my port and my service, so his service is probably going to be the proxy service, proxy handler, uh, and then uh, also initializes a, uh, uh, the peer host and peer port. Okay, um, make handler is going to make a proxy handler and call init peer in the proxy handler, more on that in a moment. And then um, here is main. Is this main? I'm a little bit confused here. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if we need main or not. We've inherited main. We not, no, no, we do need main because we're, yeah, we do need this main because it's gonna take slightly different arguments. And then here's proxy handler. He's a request handler. 
And his feature is that he has a peer, which is some kind of a correspondent. Okay. Uh, we have to initialize that peer. So we have this init peer method, which is going to be called by, that's going to be called a peer in make handler. He's going to request, create a proxy handler and call this init peer so that he knows what port he's and host he's connected to. And then here's your response method. Right? Remember, this message is coming from your client, and you're going to forward the message to your peer. Okay, and then you will return the peer's response. A lot of people who were doing this in office hours yesterday were kind of, and probably a lot of you weren't in office hours, you're kind of scratching your head. I mean, well, this seems totally useless. So this guy just seems like a useless middleman between uh, the server and the client. And you're correct. He is a useless middleman. Uh, but we're going to add subclasses to this that are going to make it useful. Speaking of yesterday's office hour, um, there were a couple of things that came up there that uh, needed some clarification. Okay, uh, one of those is like in the listen method. Um, so the listen method, let's take a look at that listen method for a second. I think I gave you code. And here's server.java. So here's your server class, here's your listen method. Here you're accepting a connection from uh, from a client, okay? And this is going to be mysocket.accept. Mysocket.accept blocks. So you're just suspended at this point until a client sends in a request. That's how it's going to be here uh, in in practice. You know, there are thousands of clients sending requests all of the time. So they're all queued up waiting for accept here. So this accept hardly ever pauses on a popular server. And it returns a socket, an ordinary socket, not a server socket. Remember, server socket is like our switchboard and socket is our telephone. The client already has, a client is a correspondent, he already has a telephone. So we've got to create a telephone on the server side and then make handler, we're gonna pass the handler this telephone. Here's your telephone. It's already connected to the client so you can just begin talking to him, okay? Um, and then we're gonna start the handler. Now, here's the thing about how to start a handler. Let me just remind you of something. I'm gonna go look at our multi-threading notes here for a moment. Remember in multi-threading, you have a choice. You can implement runnable or extend thread. And here in this example, agent implements runnable. Yeah, what we have is request handler implements runnable. And that means you have a run method, which our request handler does. That run method is just the conversation just a loop where he's conversing with the, uh, you know, with the, with the clients. Okay, but to start a, a runnable object, you have to do this. You have to create a thread with that guy in it, that agent in the thread, and then you call thread.start, which is going to call agent.run. Let's grab these pieces of code here. I'm going to So this is this is in the listen method. Yeah, 
there's something like a request handler. That right. Uh, and then, so that's what I mean by starting. You don't call handler dot, you don't call handler dot run. So if you call handler dot run, then uh, basically the handler's run method will be running in the server thread. And so the server is blocked from, from accepting new requests. Right? Uh, it's, uh, remember, this is a master slave situation. Um, Let's see. Um, okay, so let's see. Laura's asking the thread is supposed to be uh, in the listen method. How do we put it to sleep and run? Um, right. So, so that's. Uh, let's see if I understand the question here. Um, by doing this, we are spawning a new thread. This is like a new Java virtual machine. It's not a complete Java virtual machine. It doesn't have like a heap in it but it's got its own stack. So we're creating a new Java virtual machine and we're running the handler in that virtual machine. And when that handler sleeps, so the handler is a run method, as Laura said, she's referring to, and, and yes, it goes to sleep periodically. And that's just to give other handlers a, a chance to run, just so it's not hogging up the CPU. So even though there are lots of Java virtual machines, so again, Let's back up a little bit. The picture to have in your mind is you've got one server and a hundred clients. All of those clients are talking to the server. More accurately, you've got a hundred clients and a hundred request handlers. Okay, the request handlers, the 100 request handlers are all slaves of a single server. Okay, that server is running in its own thread. We call that the main thread because that's the thread where main is running in. Okay, so remember, server has main. Uh, so main is executing, uh, and uh, uh, that's a single thread. Okay, sometimes it's called the master thread or the user interface thread or the server thread. Okay, and that thread, that master, is creating these slaves running on their own little virtual uh, uh, Java machines, running inside their own little threads. So that thread pauses, but that has no, that thread sleeps, but that has no effect on the server thread. The server thread is not sleeping. Okay, uh, he's busy trying to accept new incoming requests. That accept method has in it code that blocks the server thread until you know, a message comes in. But meanwhile, all of the slave threads, the request handler threads are, are beavering away, you know, trying to like talk to their respective clients. Now, another thing that I uh, discovered, this is in uh, make, Handler. I think what we were doing there was we were doing something like a handler equals um, a handler. did something like that in there, okay? Uh, using this new instance that I showed you um, when we were talking about uh, reflection, okay? Uh, however, I noticed from looking at your code, most of you are running a more recent version of Java than I'm running, that this is deprecated, meaning that it'll eventually disappear in new releases, so you should try to like replace it. And the replacement is this,
So this is the modern way of doing it, but you might as well do the modern way. So, so it's that. And then these are both of these comments were made in the um, both of these comments are in um, are in the announcement that I sent out yesterday. Okay. Any question? Let's see. Um, so, um, we have a question about the math handler. We don't have an if statement, the math handler, request handler shutting down. Hmm. Let me just think for a second if I've seen that error before. Um, within shutting down. So essentially, what happens is that if I don't have any like if statement in that math handler and I just run quit on the simple client side, and in the server window, it'll say, sending echo zero connection reset and it'll also say request handler shutting down but if i have like an if statement in that math handler it um it says received quit request handler shutting down the client shuts down but the server is still running okay yeah so here is something to try i don't know exactly um, what is going on uh but um um, let's see, where do I want to go with this? Um, let me see. So I did see a problem like this. Because um, I kind of looked at your design for the, the casino thing and the quit works perfectly fine there. Um, so I hear a couple of comments that I'll make on that. Um, so I think here is the code that, um, so this is something that I, I think is a common problem that I don't completely understand why it's giving people problems, but, um, so this is the code that I gave you for the request handler, right? And yeah. here is what I saw. So, so um, try this. Instead of double equals here, use that. And the other thing to try too is this. So instead of using double equals here for quit, try dot equals. I tried that too and it doesn't really work. Like, so like if I, if I have that and let's just say I want to print out a request handler shutting down or something like that, nothing mm -hmm. gets printed out to the screen. But if I have, um, you know how it's a send response. So if I have sending dot equals echo quit, and then I do quit, then it'll do it correctly. But that doesn't work for the math handler part of it. It works for the request handler, like if you're just running normal commands, but it doesn't oh. work. All right, all right, all right. Um, okay, well, let's see why in that case. So it's so still, this is something uh, like another thing that came up in office hour yesterday is people were having double equals here and it wasn't really quitting. So, so you should try this. I will post something about that. Uh, and I think that what I, um, 
but uh, so so yeah so what i'm suggesting uh, is what i'm suggesting is not to use double equals here but dot equals uh, also suggesting trimming off any white space leading and trailing white space here and and i am going to have to see your math handler dot java comment further on that it's not exactly sure why that would be uh, it's, you're not overriding run i assume so I mean, your math handler should only be doing changing response. The other thing, too, is that I think I decided that break here was too mean. Um, so I'm recommending we comment out break here. Because uh, here, if it's like one little syntax error, for example, then you're shutting down the, the, the handler. And that might be too, you know, too mean. You know, maybe we need two kind of special shutdown exception or something to be thrown here. But okay, but um, that's I, I think I think my main question is why isn't the server shutting down, but the the simple client happens to shut down? Like well, if that's, I that's easy, right? I mean, the client when the client sees that the user's typed in quit, he shuts down. He sent right. a quit message and then he shuts down. So that that it's not dependent on it's not dependent on the the server. Right. So like the 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 problem arises when you have an if statement. If a, if you don't have the if statement, then all it'll yeah. do, you know, it'll say a uh, request handler shutting down, sending echo zero, connection reset. The server mm -hmm. quits and the client quits. If you're okay with that, then that works. But if you just want request handler shutting down connection reset without the sending echo zero, that's the part that um, I can't get. I can only get received quit, request handler shutting down, and then it never quits. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, it's, so it's not. Um, I'm not sure if it's a server issue or if it's the way so that it's I'm. It's this line right here, though. I mean, it's you're not getting in here is what's going on yeah and it's really it's really hard to kind of debug this right because you're running off of like you know command line right um, yeah. right so send me your code i can't I mean, this sounds a little bit specialized um from what from sounds a little bit specialized send me your okay. code for math hand sure. request handler and I'll, I'll have a look okay sure i'll do that Okay. I'll send you I'll send you a server as well just in case. All right. All right, cool. Thank you. Okay. So, next is lab 4, I think. Yeah, so lab 4 cache proxies. Okay, so here the problem we're trying to solve is this, you know, uh, you know, you have some client, he sends add two, three, four to the mass server, mass server sends back nine. And then, you know, this client, you know, is very forgetful, he goes, oh, I forgot what the answer was, so he sends add two, three, four again. Okay. Um, and so what we'd like to do is we'd like to reduce the load on the, uh, on the math server. And one way to do that, to reduce the load on a server, is to introduce a cache proxy. A cache proxy contains in it a table of all of the recent requests and what the responses were. So now what happens is add234 is going to go to a cache proxy he'll look at that request, add two, three, four, and he'll ask, is that a recent request? He'll look it up in the table, and if it is in there, he'll see that the response was nine, and he'll return nine, and he does not forward the request to his peer, which is the, the math server, okay? If it is not in the table, then he's going to, uh, he's going to have to forward it to the math server, He's gonna to have to figure out, okay, what is add two, three, four, it's nine. He sends it back, 
and then the cash proxy updates the cash table okay, before he send returns it to the client. Here is the design. So we introduce a new kind of handler, cash handler, which inherits from proxy handler. And the cash handler has a cash. Okay, and the cash inherits from uh, from what is that map here? This should probably be hash map, I think, maybe. Um, I'll have to fix that. Um, uh, so uh, remember a map here, of course, is a uh, like a two column table. First column are the keys, which are strings. The second column are the values, which are strings. And he has search. Here's the request coming from the, uh, coming from the client. A little bit bigger. Here's the request coming from the client right here, and he searches the map and he gets back the response. And then he just returns that response. If this response is no, then it wasn't in the table. Okay, so he's going to forward it to the peer. Okay, a proxy handler knows how to do that. And then when he gets the response from the peer, He's going to update. So here's the original request. Here's the response. He updates the table here, and then uh, and then it's returned. The end. The response is returned to the client. Okay. Now there are two uh, tricky things here. Uh, the first tricky thing is that um, the first tricky thing is that. Uh, Again, remember this picture, we've got like a hundred clients and we've got like a hundred cash handlers. Okay, um, so just because I wanna know what add two, three, four was, it doesn't necessarily, if you really wanna take the load off the math server, then when I say uh, add two, three, four, if anybody, has recently asked what is add two, three, four, I, it should be in the cache. That means that the cache has to be a singleton, a single object that's shared by all of the cache handlers. Okay, so we're gonna make it static. And the other thing is, remember, this is the master-slave architecture. So all of these handlers, master-slave design patterns are, all of these handlers are, threads that are sharing this shared resource, which is the cache, and the cache must be thread safe. Okay, so um, here is, let's go look at this. Um, um, this was, it's, this is actually on the uh, web page. I'll, I'll uh, which I'll show it to you in a minute. Let me make the font big. I want to change this. I'm going to make this hash map. Just update the web page real quickly. Now let's see if we can find it on the web page. Yeah, hints for labs four and five. I'm going to refresh that. Okay. So here is uh, the idea. Uh, and this is just sketchy code, right? You're gonna have to like fill this in yourself. So here I'm creating a cache, which extends hash map. Okay, that's an implementation of the map interface. And search, will search the hash map for this request. And uh, it's going to return either a string, which is the associated string. So this request might be the string add two, three, four. And then this string here would be nine as a string. Okay. Or it could just be null if it's not in there. 
And then update, we would have, here's the string, two, three, four. Here's the response from the, ser the mass server, which is nine, as a string. And we would put that into the hash map. Here's my cache handler, which extends proxy handler. So it inherits from proxy handler. And here I've got my cache. And notice that the cache is static. Okay, so there's only one cache and it's gonna be shared by all cache handlers. Of course, you need to put in a constructor here. It's gonna uh, call proxy handler constructor, the super constructor. And then you need a response method. It's this request, adds two, three, four. In step one, he's gonna search the cache for that request. And if it has the response in there, just return the response and you're done. If it's null, then he's got to forward it, he's got to forward the request to his peer. And, and that's already done. Proxy handler already does that in its response method. So I'm just going to call super.response. Right? I don't really need to know anything at all about that. So, so those of you who are thinking, oh, the proxy handler seems useless. Well, this is its usefulness, right? It knows how to forward stuff. Right, so let him, and there's a lot of, you know, send and receive and talking to the peer and so forth. I don't need to know any of that here in the cache handler. I mean, that's all, all of that machinery is nicely in the proxy, in the proxy handler. And by the way, cache handler, proxy handler, I'm implementing all of these. I'm gonna implement all of these in the echo package. So they're all part of echo. Okay, next I'm going to get the result back that returns the result. So I'll update the cache and then I just return the result. Easy. Here's how you're going to test it. You're going to create three command windows. In window one, you're going to fire up a server that uses that makes math handlers. So this is my math server. Okay. In window two, now remember that mass server by default, since I didn't specify a port, that by default listens at port 5555. And by the way, I forgot to make, mention this to the other class, but um, um, it's possible, not likely, but possible that some of these port numbers could be in use in your computer. You'll get a little error message when you try to start it up like that. So just go in and change these numbers around. Some big numbers, you know, uh, certainly like um, the first thousand ports, you know, I'm sure are gonna be used uh, uh, by services that your computer is running. So, you know, a big number on here, right? So, so the math handler by default listens at 5555. And now here I'm starting up a proxy server in this proxy, proxy server, the kinds of request handlers or cache handlers, okay? Um, this is the host's port of a peer's port, okay? So the peer is gonna be the math handler. So he's my peer, okay? And then this is the port number that the cache handler runs at, 6666. And then here in window three, I'm gonna fire up the simple client and he doesn't talk to, by default, he talks to 5555, but instead I'm gonna say, no, talk to 6666 instead. So the simple client will be talking to the cash handler, the cash handler will be talking to the math handler. And then uh, that's gonna bring up this prompt and I'll do add two, three, four, I get nine. I'll do add two, three, four again, and I'll get nine again. But here, what you wanna do is, I think my server has a debug flag in it. So you turn that on to true. And in your request handler run method, there should be some diagnostic messages that get printed out uh, if that flag is true, right? If not, put them in there. Okay, yeah, because what we want to see is that in the math handler, there is no activity the second time you do add two, three, four. That add two, three, four never makes it 
to the math handler and you need to prove that by, you know, just like I said, in the request handler run method, if, if server.debug you know, prints something out, you know, so we don't see any activity. Questions? Next, security proxies. Okay, so a security proxy uh, basically requires uh, forces clients to log in before they can access the math server. Okay, and it does so by maintaining a user table. So a user table looks like this, right? Uh, it's got usernames and what their passwords are. Okay, and it begins by uh, the client is going to type in this command new, and then the username that he wants to use and the password he wants to use. Okay, so he sends that to the he sends that to the security proxy, and the security proxy creates a new entry in the user table, and then it kills itself, commits suicide. Security proxy uh, commits suicide. That's all you can do. The idea here is that you know when you start a new, new account, like some some web app, you create a new account. They make you log in again, right? So that's what we're going to do. We're going to like shut down the security proxy. So we're going to have to restart the clients. And then the first thing the client has to do is he has to send this command, login, username, and password. Okay, and then what's gonna happen is that the security handler is gonna look it up in the table, validate the user, and he's gonna set some flag, like logged in equals true or something. And now every subsequent request is just forwarded on to here after this, okay? So it's a normal session, but you have to log in first. Let's look at the code and let's see, I'm gonna do, um, I have to update my web page again. Second. sharing with you back to this window and I'm gonna have to, have to hit refresh again I just changed something else in there here's lab five so uh, again you might have to refresh I just updated it so you'll create a class called user table and he's very similar to the cache he's going to extend hash map okay and maybe he'll have a method like get password here's the user he searches the hash map and returns the user's password or null if it wasn't there. Okay, and then here is new user. Let's see, fix that also. Here's my new user, right? And here's the, the new user's username, the new user's password. And here you're going to go update the hash map. Okay. And then here's your security handler, which extends proxy handler. Okay. And here you have a private static user table called users. And here I have a little flag logged in is false. Here you're going to put in a constructor, 
or security handler and has to call the proxy handler constructor, super. And then here is your response method. Okay, so if the thing that was typed in is new user password, if it was this command, okay, then you're going to have to call users.new user. You got a new user. And, you know, and here you might want to check first to make sure that this username isn't already in there and return some sort of an error message if it is. Okay. Uh, so that might be a good idea. And then uh, terminate the session. You can maybe do something like thread.stop or something like that in order to remember the security handler is just a thread. So let's, let's kill the thread at this point. Okay, and now, you know, there's the client's gonna have to start up a new session. Here's another possibility. So this is a login. Okay, and so what you're gonna have to do is call this get password for this username. And then you're gonna have to compare what it returns to what this user thought his password was. And if it's legit, then you're going to set the logged in flag to true. And then finally, if logged in is true, you just forward any other request to the peer, which is again done automatically for you by proxy handlers. You just call super.response request. Okay. I mean, I, I, the great thing about object oriented programming is that there are no long methods here. So, any complicated logic, you know, is spread out among lots of, you know, lots of different users. I mean, imagine if you had a math handler that, you know, also had to have the features of security and caching, right? So that's gonna be a more complicated program. And then later on, if you have a different kind of a handler, like the casino handler, and oh, you want the security handler and you want the cache handler for that as well. Well, you're going to have to rewrite a bunch of code in there. But this is all like just little pieces that we can like pipeline together, you know, and, and each little piece only has this little bit of code in it. Here's how we're going to test it. Now, what I want you to do is set up four windows. In window number one, you're going to run the math handler. In window number two, you're going to run the cache handler. Cache handler is listening at port 6666. His peer is at port 5555. Well, that's the math handler. Window number three, you're going to fire up a proxy server running the security handler. Security handler listens at port 7777, okay? And his peer is 6666, which is the cache handler. And then finally, you're gonna, in window four, run simple client. And simple client's gonna be connected to 7777, which is the security handler. Here we have session one with the simple client. And I type in here, new Smith ABC, and I get maybe a response, something like this. Okay, so now I have to do this again, fire up the client again. And I'm gonna attempt to log in, but I got the wrong password here, so I get some error message about that, try again. You can decide what you want your policy to be, like how many tries does the client get to log in? Um, you know, and it's fine if it's just one try, for example, and you shut down the, um, you shut down the, the request handler, or maybe give them three tries, you know, whatever you want to do. So now I'm going to try again. This time I have the right password, so the login is successful. So now again, I ask what's add two, three, four, I get nine. Add two, three, four, I get nine again, but this time, this is the sum of four, there's no activity in the math handler. Questions? All 
All right. He's seems to be doing okay, maybe. Um, all right. So here's I want to say a few words now to kind of wrap up things. Um, there's this lab six, which um, we're not doing. I'll just sort of quickly give you the outline of it. One drawback in, uh, uh, in ECHO is that um, ECHO has built into it the assumption that the messages being passed back and forth between client servers, um, clients and servers are strings. Okay, um, and so that's a bit of a restriction. What we would like to be able to do is to be able to exchange objects, any object you want, it doesn't have to be a string. Okay, so, so lab six asks you to improve um, Echo so that it also has the ability to read and write objects. Okay, and it turns out that this is pretty easy to do. So in the corresponding class, we have read and uh, receive and send, I think they're called, which work with strings. We're gonna also have write object and read object. Write object takes any object as an input and it sends it to the, uh, it's gonna send it to the, to the server the peer or whatever and then read object re receives objects coming from the server okay and uh, how do these work the dot 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 here it's exactly the same if you go to MVC uh, let's see maybe we can actually do this um, These are the MVC notes, and I think in here I gave you some code. Yeah, utilities.java. And here, for example, save. So here, um, I created an object output stream, okay? And you could write the model, which was an object into the output stream, and then open, here I created an object input stream and you can, you can read, it returns like a new model. Okay, the only requirement for on the model for these to work is that the model must implement the serializable interface. Okay, now here my object output stream, object input stream were connected to a file, but they can also be connected to the output stream of a socket or the input stream of a socket. Okay, so it's very easy to, um, let's see, it's very easy to implement these things. Right? Very easy to implement these two messages. And the beauty of this is that if you have a serializable object, what serializable means, think about it, right? It, uh, I mean, when I think about an object, a picture like um, a two-dimensional picture where like a graph where the nodes are objects and the arrows are pointers to each other. So it's this complicated graph-like structure, okay? But a stream is just a sequence of bytes. So somehow I have to take this complicated graph, including these pointers, which are addresses that are only meaningful in the address space of the program, and I have to hammer it down into a sequence of bytes. So that's called, that process is called serialization. And when I read a sequence of bytes from a socket or a file, I have to 
I have to puff it back up into this, this network of, of objects and pointers. That puffing it back up again is called deserialization. And it's a hard problem to solve, and which is why it's amazing. It's hard to do that if you have to write the code for serialization, deserialization, but Java does it for you automatically. Okay, so, so then here I'm gonna introduce this new class called message. Okay, message uh, is a generic class. It has T, T is the con type of the content of the message. T can be any class at all as long as it's serializable. Okay, and then message itself implements serializable. And so the message basically just has a, a content, which can be anything. And uh, you can initialize the content with the constructor and two string, you know, sort of shows you what the content is. Okay, and so now um, you can you can uh, redo labs one through four again, but sending uh, these messages instead of you know instead of sending sending messages instead of sending strings. These messages that can encapsulate any object at all. Okay, so very easy to remove that restriction of only strings can be sent back and forth to a client server. Now, any serializable object can. Why um, do we need this? Well, so for our last, um, our last distributed architecture, I want to turn you on to distributed objects architecture. Okay, so this is kind of the ultimate vision of object-oriented programming. Some of you may have heard of things like the Corba architecture. Okay, um, this is what it's all about. Also, Web 2.0, this is what it's all about. So here is the vision of distributed objects architecture. Um, in object-oriented programming, I have a program, and in my program, I've got a bunch of objects, and the objects are sending messages back and forth to each other by like invoking each other's methods. Right? That's the object-oriented programming. You learn about CS46A, CS46B. You have a bunch of objects. The objects are invoking the methods of other objects, and all of those objects live inside of the same program. Distributed objects architecture has the same vision, but now we don't know if these objects are in our program or if they live in other programs, possibly running on different computers on, on the internet. So we've got objects scattered all throughout the internet. And these objects are talking to each other but they're doing it just using this syntax, the ordinary syntax that you use um, for just you know, invoking the method, a method invocation syntax, invoking the method of some object. So, so some object dot some method, and here are the inputs A, B, and C. Okay, but when you look at this piece of code, we don't know is some object local or is it remote? Okay, so that's cool, right? Because now you can have these objects that are just sitting out there performing some service for you, sitting out in the internet somewhere, and uh, you, you can invoke these services, okay? Um, Service-oriented architecture, is that it? Maybe I better watch out with that term. Um, not service, but like web services. The web services architecture, that's the vision there. So these remote objects are just web services that are out there, you know, performing services for other, for other objects. So the, the whole internet becomes uh, just like the memory of an object-oriented program. The whole internet is a gigantic object-oriented program. And it's really easy for programmers because they don't do anything different, okay? 
So this idea here of you know, just invoking the method of a possibly remote object, that's made possible through a technology called RMI, Remote Method Invocation. In the old days, it used to be called um, um, Remote Procedure Call, RPC, or, uh, but now you know, everything's a method, so it's Remote Method Invocation. Uh, Java has this feature built into it, RMI. Uh, I have notes somewhere in my Java notes. If you want to like get all of the details about how to use RMI, but here we're going to uh, implement it. So here's the setup. So let's say that I want to uh, pro offer like a service to you know, the internet. So I begin by defining this service interface, and you know here I've got service A, B, C, and I'm not showing any parameters or return values, but you know, they can be there. And then here is my remote object, I'll call it, and it implements this interface. It actually implements these methods. Okay, over here I've got a client running on a different program. Okay, and uh, the client, his remote object, so what I'm referring to here of, um, his remote object pointer points to something called a stub. And the stub is running in the same program as the client. And the stub implements the desired interface. So the client thinks, oh, well, that's convenient. You know, here's an object right here. I call him my remote object, even though he's not really remote. And he implements this interface. What he doesn't realize is that service A, B, and C here, what they do is they are going to use the technology that we've been using of sockets, and they are going to be forwarding these requests to this guy over here called the skeleton. Skeleton also has service A, B, and C. Okay, service A here is gonna call, and he has a pointer to the remote object, so service A here calls service A here, and so forth. But the skeleton is a request handler. It's a request handler. So it's getting these requests from the stub, getting the remote object to satisfy these things, and then returning them to the stub, which returns them to the client. The client doesn't realize that all of this has happened. It just looks like, well, the stub somehow knew how to implement these services. He didn't realize that the message is going from the stub to the skeleton to the remote object and then coming back again. Here's the code. So here's the some interface, iRemote, I call it. It's got service A and service B. And these guys for now just have strings in them. This is the remote object, that's this class here. He implements iRemote. And here, here is the implementation of service A and B. It doesn't do much, just returns X, just echoes X back with like AAA or BBB prependage to it. Here is the stub. The stub is on the client side. Okay, he is a correspondent, which just means he you know, has a telephone basically. And uh, he implements the iRemote interface. Here's service A and service B. Service A, he's going to use send object. Here's a message I'm going to create. Service A with input X. And then here he calls receive object and casts it as a string and returns that to the client. Here's the client. Remote object is actually a pointer to a stub. By the way, the stub and skeleton in Java RMI are automatically generated for you, so you don't really have to write this code at all. And uh, you know, and here is the syntax: remote object dot service A, remote object dot service B. And then here's the skeleton. He's a request handler. He has a pointer to remote object, so that's this pointer right here. Okay, 
And uh, here's the response method. All request handlers need that. I'm going to get a message. If the message is the method is service A, I'm going to return object.service A, m.input, and so forth. Okay, so, so by using this trick here, this RMI trick, which is just based on what we already have in Echo Handler you can implement remote method invocation. And to me, that's kind of the, the ultimate application of client server is to make it so that, so that the fact that the client and server are running on different computers is invisible to the client and also invisible to the server too. The server doesn't know anything about that the remote client and client doesn't know anything about the remote server. Instead, they're this stub and skeleton that are kind of in between them that are handling all of the details of remote communication by passing objects back and forth, which is made possible by this extension to, you know, to our echo framework. So I think that you know, my vision for things is that sort of the ultimate client server architecture is the distributed objects architecture. So client server predates object oriented programming. What I want to do is I want to, I want to take client server architecture and build on top of it this distributed objects architecture. On the other hand, we talked about peer to peer architectures. And what I want to do with that is I want to take our agent-based architecture and build that on top of like a peer-to-peer -peer architecture. The difference between, um, between multi-agent distributed objects are distributed objects, these objects are passive. They just sit there, right? Like this remote object is passive. It just sits there. Somebody has to call his methods. In my version of the distributed version of, of, of um, multi-agent architecture, this remote object is an agent that's active. He's constantly doing things. Okay, so ooh, they're active, not passive. Okay, and that wraps it up for distributed architectures. Um, Let's see, um, let me just give you a little preview of what happens next. What happens next is um, Thursday and Tuesday, we're gonna do uh, the last architecture, which is called open architecture. And um, we'll have a little lab that we'll do in class on Monday, on Tuesday for that. Um, and open architectures uh, basically makes it possible to do a new kind of programming called component-based development. There are other names for this um, services architecture. Open architecture is sometimes called uh, service-oriented architecture. Component-based development is, think about that as object-oriented development light. Okay, or I'm going to say this thing, which is a bad thing to say, but I'll say it anyway. Component-based development, it's object-oriented programming for business majors. Okay, um, now that actually is an important thing because uh, people who run uh, you know, uh, information systems, MIS people, Okay. Um, they need to put together these like fairly complicated enterprise applications, which are built out of lots of different, there's an HR component, a shipping component, a warehousing component, an e-store component, you know, all of these components and they have to like assemble them, you know, and the way they assemble them is through some kind of an open architecture, a container and they can drag and drop these things into. Uh, so component-based development, again, it'll be like kind of a light version of object-oriented programming. You might be thinking, oh good, you know, that sounds easier than object-oriented. It is easier than object-oriented programming. Unfortunately, your job is going to be to build a platform that allows component-based development. And that turns out to be um, 
incredibly tricky to do, but also very cool to do. So we'll uh, launch into that on Thursday. How are we doing? Any questions? Okay, well, I will check my email and I'll schedule an office hour for Friday and you know, I'll get this lecture posted as soon as I'm able. Uh, and I will see you all on Thursday. Bye.